Verse 13, I'm going to read from verse 11, but let's go to verse 13 first. We're going to stay there. I'm going to tell you some things that we ought to be doing. We ought to be busy. And he called his ten servants and delivered to them ten pounds. This is a parable. And a simplistic uh, definition is an uh, earthly story with heavenly meaning. He called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. That's what we're talking about. Occupy till I come. You're watching, but you're occupying. You're watching, but you're occupying. Father, I pray that you will edit this message tonight, that you will audit this message tonight. And Lord, only what should be said from this pulpit will be said, that you will get all the glory and the praise. Lord, let the entrance of your word give us light. I bind every spirit of rebellion, every Jezebel spirit, every evil spirit planted in this house to distract, and disrupt, I bind in the name of Jesus. I resist the devil in the name of Jesus. There's only one spirit that has any, any authority in this house tonight. It is the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Glory to God. The Lord said occupy till I come. What does the word occupy mean? The word occupy means to trade. But we're not going to use that definition. The other definition of occupy is to busy yourself with. To busy yourself with. So you got to be busy. You got to busy yourself with certain things. Let me read this in context, beginning at verse 11. So that uh, I really want to let you get, this, get into the scriptures these days. So that you'll be able to stand on your two feet. The Bible said you always need to have an answer. You ought to have an answer to give to those who ask you the hope. Why are you serving the Lord? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? You always ought to have an answer. Verse 11. And as they heard these things in Luke chapter 19, he added and spake a parable. Because he was knighted to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. So listen to the parable. And he said, therefore, a certain nobleman, if it's a parable, we know we're talking about Jesus. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to come back. Our nobleman is coming back and he's coming soon. And he called his ten servants, that's you, that's me. And he delivered to them ten pounds. And he said to them, occupy till I come. Don't sit down and waste time. Don't twiddle your thumbs. Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him. Oh, that's so, so, so true today. His citizens hated him. And sent a message after him saying, we're not going to have this man to reign over us. We are not saying that in direct terms today, but we are saying that. People are saying that. Verse 15. And it came to pass that when he was returned, brethren, he's going to come back. Our Savior is coming back. The nobleman is coming back. When he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called to him. You are going to be called one of these days. Hope it is not before the judgment seat, but we hope, we hope it's before the beamer seat where Christians will be judged. You would want to be before the judgment, the beamer seat. He commanded the servants to be called to him, to whom he had given money. God has given you talents. He's given you the word of God. He's given you the spirit of God. He's given you the blood of Jesus. He's given you so many things to work with. He's given you so many things to trade with. To whom he had given the money, that he might know how much any, every man had gained by trading. If you're going to trade, you, you trade, you expect to have a gain. Okay? Verse 16. Then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And the master said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because you have been faithful in very little. You hear that? Because you've been faithful in very little. People in church don't think they could be faithful unless they're on the pulpit or before a camera or have a microphone. No, no, no. Because you've been faithful and very little, have authority over ten cities. The second came in verse, nine, verse 18. Saying, Lord, your pung has gained five pounds. He's a real good trader. And Jesus said unto him, the, the master said likewise to him, be thou over five cities. Hallelujah so far. But verse 20. And another came saying, Lord, 
Behold, here's your pound, which I have kept in a napkin. Lord, here's your pound, take it. For I fear thee, because you are a hard man. You take up where you laid not down, and you reap where you did not sow. And he said unto him, the nobleman is saying to him, Out of your own mouth will I judge you, you wicked servant. If you're not occupying, the Lord said you're wicked. Not the pastor, not the church, the Lord. He said, if you're not occupying, you're wicked. He said, thou knowest, verse 22, that I was a hard or austere man, taking up that which I laid not down, and reaping that which I did not sow. Why then did you not give my money into the bank? Why did you put my money in the bank? That when I come back, I would have my money with usury. That's the old English word for interest. I will have my money with interest. Why did you do that? Verse 24. And he said unto them that stood by, Look, take from him that pound that he has wrapped up there in a napkin. And give, give to him that have ten pounds. And you see always that happened in the church many times. There are people who are always used in church all the time. Because they invest. And those who are not working, it seem, seemingly the Lord takes from them and gives to another person. And people get jealous. You're always using she, you're always using he or whatever. Follow something in the scripture, you might learn something. Uh, I am in verse, verse what? I am in verse 22. Verse 20. Verse 25. And they said unto him, but Lord, he got 10 pounds already. You're going to give him another pound? See, man thinks differently. The Lord said, your ways are not my ways. Neither are your thoughts my thoughts. The Lord said, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so far are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Amen? Verse 26. For I say unto you, that everyone, somebody say everyone, which half shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that which he has shall be taken away. But those my enemies which would not that I should reign over them, bring them and slay them before me. Verse 13, occupy till I come. Be busy. Be busy in yourself with something worthwhile. So I thought that I will find from the scriptures what we ought to be doing. What did God say we ought to be doing? How should we occupy ourselves? You'll find a very, very good text in Luke chapter, sorry, in Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. I'm going to read the first eight verses, although I only want verse eight. But here I'm on a mission. A revival of the Bible is what I'm after. You've got to know the scriptures. And so that's why I'm reading uh, long passages these days. Verse 10. And when he'd call unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power. Just like he's given you. He gave them power against unclean spirits. To do what? To cast them out. To heal all types of sickness and disease. That is verse 1. And verse 2. Give the names of these 12. Verse 3. Continue with the names. Verse 4. Continue with the names. And then verse 5 said. These 12 Jesus sent forth. You wouldn't believe that God has sent forth the church today. We come before the, between the four walls. And we sit down all the time. And to make matters worse. We pray that God will fill the church. When the Lord actually said to us, go into the highways and hedges. But I'm going to get there. Uh, I'm in that verse, um, verse 5. These 12 disciples Jesus sent forth and commanded them saying, go not in the way of the Gentiles. And into the city of the Samaritans, don't go. But go to the lost house of Israel. Okay? And as you go, preach saying, this is how you're going to occupy. As you go preach preach saying this the kingdom of heaven is near at hand means near i've been saying that this morning and all the other messages the kingdom of god is near the lord is coming to set up his kingdom thy kingdom done thy, ki thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven thy kingdom come thy will will be done on earth as it is in heaven it is not done on earth yet as it is in heaven because there's no murder and sin and immorality in heaven. But the will of God will be done one of these days. It's not yet. So he said also in verse 8. And this is where I want you to zero in. He said, don't only go and preach that the kingdom of God is at heaven. Is at hand. But I want you to, to demonstrate something. 
I want you to heal the sick. I want you to cleanse the lepers. I want you to raise the dead. I want you to cast out devils. Freely you have received. Freely give. Do not carry a script for your journey. I will put in your heart what you need to say. You don't have to have a lot of notes. So don't carry a script for your journey. Don't carry two coats because I will provide for you. You don't have to carry two coats. In case one fails, I will provide for you. You don't have to carry money in your purses because I will supply your need. Uh, verse, verse 10, no script for your journey, neither two coats, nor shoes, nor staves. Even when the wild animals come, I will look after you, for the workman is worthy of his meat. Verse 11, and into whatsoever city or tongue you shall enter, inquire in it who is worthy, and there abide until you go things. And we can read the ballots later on. But I want verse 8. Verse 8 says that we as believers, God has given us a command. He's given us the right. He's given us the authority. And he's given us all the tools to heal the sick, to cleanse the lepers, to raise the dead, to cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Because you perhaps have not heard a sermon about raising the dead. I chose to speak on that tonight. We hear all the time about casting out demons in verse 8. We hear about healing the sick. And we have prayer lines and all that. And we hear about freely receiving, freely. But we hardly hear about raising the dead. Maybe God wants me to talk about this tonight. Or perhaps on the bus tomorrow somebody will collapse. Dead. I wonder how many people died in the hospital. Because Christian personnel in the hospital were either too em embarrassed or too lazy to do what the Lord has said here. I wonder if there were doctors or nurses or whoever that should be raising the dead like the Lord said. And people went on to glory or to hell before their time because personnel on the spot did not do what the Lord said. Maybe... Somebody in the, in the supermarket where you are will get shot. And they're there. And the Lord said, you as a believer, we're occupying. Today we're talking about raising the dead. I want that to be foremost in your mind. You call the ambulance. And you call the ambulance at 8 o'clock in the morning. You might as well call the hearse. Because the traffic is going to stop you. Somebody with a heart attack or whatever. But you are saying to the person, the Lord said you, not the doctor. The Lord said you should raise the dead. Not the nurse, not the doctor. You are supposed to do it. Isn't that what is written in scripture? And you could do it. Listen, the body is such a complex piece of material. Pardon me for putting it that way. It is so complex. And with all its complexities, after it has died... God said, you, not the surgeon, not the doctor, not people, all these fancy names. Thank God for them, we want them. But you, you, by just faith in God, can jumpstart all of those systems. Just by faith in God. You're looking at me like you don't believe that. Did I not just read that? Did not the Lord say, go and, and raise the dead? And as complex as it is, listen, let me tell you a little bit about the complexity of the human body. And understand that you have the right and you have the authority to raise a person from the dead. Because God says so. I was coming to church on Thursday night and I heard the doctor, the doctor online. And he was saying, he was saying, we don't even understand anything about the, about the brain. And, but the little that we understand, and, and he went on to talk about that. Because they said that we don't even understand 10% about the brain. The Lord used his hands to form that brain. He knows how to repair it and whatever the case may be. Psalm 139, I think, I'm not sure, says that we were intricate, intricately formed in our mother's womb. But what I want to say at this juncture is that the body is complex, really complex, really, really, really complex. And God said to you and to you that if it conks out, that you're supposed to jump start it. Like a car that wouldn't start. And you come with a, with a battery or whatever, a, ba a pack, and you jump start that. God said you could do it. God said you could do it. As a matter of fact, 
He commands you to do it. He commands you to do it. To raise the dead. And people are dying everywhere these days. In stores, barbershops, along the street, whatever. And that is going to increase. Let me tell you a little bit more about the complexity of the body. You see, the human body is a very complex organism. And it comprises of several different systems. As I give you these systems, bear it in my mind so that when you're praying about your healing, you could target one particular area. For example, the body is made of a skeletal system. Skeletal? That is the bones. Skeletal system? So when you have problems with your bones, Lord, I speak to my skeletal system. You see how specific you can be? I'm just at this point telling you about the body. And as complex as it is, you have more authority than the surgeon. Because we're going to talk about Lazarus. Where that body was dead for four days, no surgeon can bring that back. You know, the medical people think that the, that the doctors are the best gift of the human race, you know. They don't appreciate and respect people's uh, uh, engineers that can build buildings that are, that are 100 stories up in the air. They don't respect them. They think that only the doctor is somebody. The medical people think so. All these, some that I know. They're the best thing after sweet bread. But we're going to see a man's dead for four days now. You can call who you want to call with the doctor. He could have all sorts of names behind his, all sorts of things behind his name. And we thank God for them. Because if we don't have them, some Christians are going to die. And all the unsaved are going to die. So we need them. But I'm showing you, I'm trying to tell you about the power that you have. So this skeletal system provides support and structure to the body. If you don't have the, these bones inside here, it would be just like one, one formless mass of protoplasm. Huh? That's, that's all you will be. You won't be able to stand up because you don't have any muscles. So we talk about the skeletal system. And then you have the muscular system. You know the muscles? Muscular system. The muscular system allows the body to move and perform physical activities. So you have the muscles. You have the tendons. You have connective tissue. That is the muscular system. Sometimes you have muscular dystrophy. You know what is that? What is that? And the muscles don't work so well. And your head blah, 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 because the muscles not work and your hands are floppy. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, if, you're not, if you don't know, you're getting the education tonight. But there's some other system, like the nervous system, for example. The nervous system controls the body's responses to both internal and external stimuli. You might say stimulus, but stimuli. It is made up of the brain, the spinal cord, and the nerves. That is the nervous system. As complex as you are hearing about this now, you have the authority that doctors don't have unless they're born again. You don't have to get a scalpel to cure somebody of cancer. You don't have to get anybody radiation to cure somebody from cancer. The, the professionals got to do that, not you, not me. God said that we believe in him, we have the authority. He called these in verse 8, he said, I give you authority to heal the sick. To raise the dead. To cast out devils. Freely you have received. Freely do it. So you don't get scared. Because God has called us to do it. If not us, who? If not, no. When? But you have some more system. You have this circular, circulatory system. That has to do with the blood flowing through your body. And that has given a lot of trouble these days. Because vessels, blood vessels are becoming clogged. And all sorts of things that happen with them. Because of what we eat and because of what we don't eat. So the circulatory system uh, transports oxygen and nutrients and other substances throughout the body. It is made of the heart, the blood vessels, and the blood. So you got to pray to God and say, Lord. And, and, and not only that, you gotta, you got to talk to your blood vessels. Talk to them. Did Jesus not talk to a tree? Did Jesus not say you could talk to the mountain to command the mountain to move? Did the Lord not say you could, you could command the sycamine tree and it has to obey you? When you look down at your feet and say, feet, in the name of Jesus, you're going to receive blood. You're going to receive blood down to the tip of my toes. If you could talk to a tree, you could talk to, you could talk to brain, you are going to receive blood. In the name of Jesus. You speak to your circulation system. They're giving trouble. You eat a lot of salt, you have high blood pressure. Cut down on that. Um... I'm not going to get into the other things because the, 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 the medical people here are already looking at me like, I don't know what he's saying. So I'm, going, I'm not going to get any further than that. Amen? All right. Are you with, are you with me? Yeah. We talk about the skeletal system that has to do with the bones, the muscular system, the nervous system. 
the circulation system. A lot of people die from that. Do you know that more than half of the persons who die in the world every day die from something that has to do with the circulation system? Either they have blood clots, or they have brain, brain bleeds, or they have, their heart is not getting enough blood, the brain is not getting enough blood, uh, the muscles not getting enough blood, the kidneys not getting enough blood. So you need to pray every day about your circulation system. All right? But then we move from there to the respiratory system. That has to do with breathing. That has to do with breathing. You don't want to have problems with that either. You don't want to walk around all day long with oxygen, oxygen on, uh, on your nose, these, these tubes up in your nose. Somebody was telling me only two days ago that a relative of theirs, they, they don't even have the small bottles. They have the big bottles that you do when you're welding. Big, big bottles, and everywhere they go, they have to have these bottles because there's a shortage of, they, they, apparently, the, their lungs can't process whatever's going on, so you have problems. You need to pray about that. You can live for 100 years. Pray about that. Pray about your circulation. I pray about mine. I don't have to ring a bell and say I pray about that, but that's what I do, and I want to encourage you tonight to do, do the same thing. I'm trying at this point to show you how complex the body is and yet, if it dies, you could kickstart it as a child of God. You could kickstart that. Your grandmother died, you can call the ambulance. And the first thing going to tell you, we ain't got no, no. Because that's all you ever hear from the hospital these days. We ain't have any. You're looking at me like you don't believe that you could kickstart those bodies. I'm going to show you in the scripture in a minute. Then you have, we talk about the respiratory system. Uh, I could tell you also about the digestive system. Has to do with digestion, has to do with your alimentary canal, which starts from your mouth all the way down to, to the end. All right? You have your large intestines, small intestines, and I'm coming across a lot of people these days who are having problems with constipation. Constipation. That has to do with your digestive system. And by the way, guys, when you get sick, go see a doctor. Go see a doctor, not a nurse, a doctor. Doctors diagnose. Nurses treat the patient with, with what the doctor says. She can't diagnose if you're sick. When, when you go and tell, tell a nurse, I got a pain in my belly, she can tell you something, but a pain in your belly could be caused by a hundred different things. How does she know which one? Which one is, is your problem? But the doctor know he's going to connect some things. He's not only going to connect your belly, he's going to connect some things in your brain and all about and he could give a proper diagnosis. If you are not feeling well, see a doctor, not a nurse. Or the orderly. Because I know orderly many years ago, about 50 years ago, who used, to, who used to do abortions. Make a lot, a lot of money. Used to live down there by Max Berries, I know for sure. So if you're not feeling well, nurses can't diagnose. Am I right, Shannon? Nurses don't diagnose. See a doctor. Call him up. The digestive system. Two more systems. The next one is the endocrine system. That has to do with your uh, diabetes, your insulin, your pancreas. So when you go before God and say, in fact, you don't go, go before God. Don't wait till it falls apart. Pray about your endocrine system now. Pray about your pancreas. You don't want to have cancer in the pancreas because... Surgery on the pancreas, I understand, is very, very difficult. And if you get cancer of the pancreas, you're going to die. Is it having cancer of the colon? Because those are, those are real difficult uh, surgeries to have. But you can pray about it. If the Lord said you could raise the dead, you could stop him from dying in the first place. Nobody didn't talk to me, so I could say amen, amen. The endocrine system regulates the, horm the hormones and controls various body functions. It comprises glands and the pituitary gland and the thyroid gland and the adrenal gland. All of that is in your endocrine system. And the final one I want to talk to you about is the immune system. That is the system that helps your body to fight off infection and fight off diseases. It comprises of cells and tissues and organs such as lymph nodes and the spleen and the white blood cells. I tell you, I sound like a doctor tonight. Yeah, it's not good. I just read it. <laughs> just read it. Yeah. So look, the Lord said, raise the dead. That body is really complex. 
And we ain't talk anything about the brain. We ain't talk about the brain. We ain't talk about the eyes. Like, you know, you see something, it goes into the back of your eye upside down. You know when you see something, it goes into your eye upside down. Talk to me. You know that? Upside down. And then your brain has to work with your eyes and put it upside right, right, right side up. But when you look at it, it registers in the back of your eye upside down. And then your brain. So it is a real, the body is a real complex organism. But it dies sometime. And I want now for the next few minutes that we have to show you from the word of God that I'm not lying when I tell you that you can raise the dead. First reason is that God gives you a command. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 8. He commanded them. He said, go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. That's before they die. Catch them before they die. Heal the sick. Number two, raise the dead in verse 8. Raise the dead. Now, in the Bible, there are ten instances of persons being raised from the dead. They were as dead as a doornail. I'm going to start with Lazarus because um, I know some would say that doctors raise people from the dead too. By giving them, um, you know, they die, you pump their chest. What do you call that again? Whatever. CPR. Huh? Well, the doctors is real people from the dead too. They get a CPR and they come back to life. All right, all right, but let me go, let me go four days then. Let's see what the doctor's going to do if he's dead four days. So when we start at Lazarus, we're going to find him in John chapter 11. You can read the first 44 verses, but I'm not going to go there. But there's a section... It says that Lazarus was sick, and his sisters Mary and Martha uh, called for Jesus, uh, and, and Jesus did not come right away, and he died. And, and, and by the time Lazarus, uh, by the time Jesus shows up, Lazarus was dead and buried for four days. People, a human being, can raise that person from the dead. Four days, and we're gonna see Jesus came to them. Martha and Mary, one of them began to complain. If you had come earlier, my brother would not have died. They don't know who they're talking to. They don't know they're talking to the resurrection and the life. Huh? Huh? He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. So he come and said, where, 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 you bar, where, where do you have, have you laid him? He's here in this tomb. Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he's thinking, tell me which surgeon can work on that. i raise him to the dead. These systems that I just told you, all of them begin to fall apart already. Four days. All of them. Skeletal system, not so much so because it's harder. That'll probably take five years to totally uh, dissolve. But the brain and the heart and all these functions, four days. No hope for four days. But Jesus, Martha said, by this time he stinketh. He's been dead four days. Now let us read verse 40, from verse 40. And see what's happening. Jesus said unto her, did I not say to you, if you would believe, you will see the glory of God. Let's pause there for a little bit. Did I not tell you that if you will believe, you will see the glory of God? If you would believe that you can raise the dead, you will see the glory of God too. The day is going to come that right here at a funeral at the Pegwell Community Church, right here, with that coffin laid out in front of me. I'm going to walk up to that person and say, get up in the name of Jesus. Get up. And the case don't walk I'll say, get the hell up. That God raised them. Huh? Get up. Get up. I'm really looking forward to that, you know. Because I'm praying these days, and I'm telling this because I want to pray the same thing. I'm telling the Lord these days, a lot of talk, a lot of long talking enough. Paul said to the Corinthians, when he came to you, I didn't come with excellency of speech. But I came with demonstration of the power of God. Where is the church demonstrating the power of God today? Oh, I saw something on television yesterday. And the pastor was hitting those people that he was praying for so hard. I'm surprised that their skeletal system didn't fall apart right in front of him. Anybody saw that one? That man, bam, in the woman's forehead. And she's knocked over. There's another fellow who heals men by taking them on the shoulder like they're WWE wrestling. And throws them into the chairs. 
paddled them into the chairs. Yeah, that, that's what's happening these days. Get he what? No. The Lord said, let things be done decently and in order. I'm not saying that you don't see some unusual things when, you know, but, but, but not, not that. That is, that is crazy. Yesterday we see the one going through the roof. He's, he's, he's going to heaven and leaving this congregation there. If you would believe, the world says, the world says seeing is believing. God says no. God says believing is seeing. If you believe, then you will see. Look, it's there. If you would believe. The world says believing is seeing. You know, believing is seeing. No. The Lord, I mean, seeing is believing. That's what the world says. Seeing is believing. God says no. If you would believe, you will see the glory of God. So obviously they believe. And let's see what happened in the next verse. Verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that you heard me. Verse 42. I thank you that you heard me. And I know that you hear me always. That sentence there means a lot to me. Because the Bible says that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding for me. So I know that as he intercedes for me, the Father hears him always. Always. So whatever he's praying about for me, the Father is hearing. I would love to know what he's praying about. But whatever he's praying about, the Father is hearing. Okay? But because of the people that stood by, that they might believe that you have sent me. Verse 42. He said, verse 43, he's saying, when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And when he had thus said, and, and he that was dead came forth, he was still bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, loose him and let him go. Somebody said, okay, Jesus could do that, but we can't do that. So let me show you then. Let me show you some other situations. Do you know there was a lady called? Let's go into the Old Testament. In 1 Kings chapter 17. I'm going to begin at verse 17. There's a woman called a widow of Zarephath. 1 Kings chapter 17. I'm going to begin at verse 17. And show that this was done by Elijah. Elijah. Because when you raised last year, you say, oh, he's God. He could have done that. No, let me show you now a normal human being like you and me. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, the son fell sick. And his sickness was so great that there was no breath left in him. He died. He died. And she said unto Elijah, what have I to do with you, O thou man of God? Are you come to call my sin to re remembrance and slay my son? And Elijah said to her, give me your son. And he took the son out of her bosom. And carried him up into a loft where he abode. And he laid the child upon his own bed. And he cried to the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon this widow whom I, with whom I served her by slaying her son? Verse 21. Verse 21. And he stretched himself upon the child three times. Elijah. He stretched himself upon the child three times. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, I pray thee. This is how you could, this is how you could pray when you want to raise the dead. Uh, let this child's soul come to him again. Let this child's soul come to him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. And the soul of the child came unto him again. And he revived. So here is Elijah raising the dead. Elijah said, I'm, a, I'm just like you. He was a man subject to like passions just like me. And he prayed that it would not rain. And it did not rain. Now you see him raising the dead. I want to convince you. I don't think you're there yet. But I want to convince you that God has commanded you to raise the dead. Not only to heal the sick. Not only to cleanse the lepers. But to raise the dead. Let me talk to you about a Shunammite woman. Shunammite woman. Let, let's not talk about her right now because I don't have her, her reference right here. So let me talk about an, an unnamed man in 2 Kings chapter 13, begin at verse 20. This is one of the real strange raising of the dead. They were going to bury this man. 
and they saw the enemy coming in the other direction. And they hastily pelt the coffin in the hole that was open. And when the coffin hit the bones that were in there, the man stood up and started talking. You know who the bones in there were belonging to? The bones were Elisha's bones. And just touched bones. Years after Elisha was dead, touched his bones and life came back to the dead. Are you still with me? You guys ready to go home? Life came back from dead bones. How about you to her life? It came to pass as they were burying a man, that behold, they spied a band of men, and they cast the man into the sepulcher or the grave of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones, man, this is really rebuke to me. Just touch Elisha's bone, the man revived and stood up on his feet. Just touch his bones. What are we doing in church today? When the Lord said, I give you power. I've already given you the power. I've given you the command to go and raise the dead. What on earth are we doing? What on earth are we doing? I could tell you in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 7, begin at verse 11, there was a widow from a place called Nain. And there I end Nain. She was going out to bury her son. And Jesus met the funeral procession and stopped it and raised the boy from the dead. Luke 7, begin at verse 11. Luke 7, begin at verse 11. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him and much people. And when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out. He was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. May I have the husband? No, she lost her son. And she was a widow. And much people of that city was with her. And look what happened. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the coffin. Just touch it. And they that bear, bear him stood still. And he said, Young man, young man. I say to you, arise, get up. So what happened? Let's see. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And Jesus delivered him to his mother. Look, we have enough evidence here that I could give you for the whole night. Remember Jairus in Mark chapter 5? But that let's bypass Jairus and leave Jairus for sometime during the week. Because I want to talk about two more. I want to talk about a woman called Tabitha. Her other name was Dorcas. I want to talk about her. She's in Matthew chapter 27. We could begin at verse 50, but I don't think I will get enough to begin at verse 50. She was like a needle worker. Huh? I'm talking about, I'm talking about uh, Dorcas. No, she's an Acts. Acts chapter 9, begin at verse 36. She had two names, Dorcas, Tabitha, and she died. People are going to die around you. There's a man called Benson Idahosa. Take down. Benson Idahosa. He died a few years back. He died early as well. He was an African. And he heard messages that can preach you that God can raise the dead. And he believed it so much that every day he used to go through his village in Nigeria from house to house asking, Do you have anybody in here dead? Do you have anybody in here dead? And he is on record as having raised 13 persons from the dead. Benson Idahosa. Go check him online. He's still online. Because he believed that if God said it, I should raise the dead, I should do it. How many of you believe that? So he actually went around asking, is anybody dead? Anybody dead? But look at this. Look at, ah, I like that, Adam. Look at this. Who we are talking about right now? We are talking about Dorcas. She's in Acts chapter 9. Let's begin at verse 36. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is by interpretation Dorcas. This woman was full of good works. This is why I'm reading this. I want to get this part. She was full of good works and alms deed which she did. She worked with the old people and the sick people and alms deed. This is what she did. And it came to pass in those days that she got sick and she died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in the upper chamber. And look what the people are going to do now. And for as much as Lydda was night to Joppa, the disciples heard 
that Peter was up there in Lydda. So they sent two men to tell him, come down, come down quickly. Darkest is dead, come down, you got to do something. So look at verse 39. Verse 39. Verse 39. Then Peter arose and went with them. And when he was come, they brought him to the upper chamber where she was. And all the widows stood by him weeping. If you die, anybody weep for you? Don't answer the question. Just asking. Anybody weep for you if you die? And, and all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and the garments which Dorcas made while she was alive. Look at the next verse. Then Peter put them all forth, put them out. And he kneeled down and he prayed. And turned into the dead body, he said, Tabitha, arise, get up. And she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up. The Lord tells us to go raise the dead. You can never tell when a situation will happen in your house or in a bus or in the supermarket, or somewhere. We could raise the dead. They have a fellow called Eutychus in Acts chapter 20, verses 7 to 12. Paul was preaching. And Paul was preaching till past midnight. And Eutychus was sitting in the windowsill. Sitting in the windowsill. And he fell asleep. Listen, when you're straddling the fence serving God, one foot in and one foot out, when you fall, you don't ever fall in. You know anybody who ever fell into the church? You always fall out. So he fell out three stories. He fell out and died. But Paul was preaching. Let's see what happened. And they sat and Paul went, no, go, go back. Let's go back from verse 7 or so. From verse 7. And they sat in a window. A certain young man called Eutychus. Being fallen into deep sleep. And Paul, as Paul was long in preaching... He sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third story, three stories up, and was taken up dead. Huh? Next verse. And Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, trouble not yourself for his life is in him. They must laugh at him. Verse 11. Verse 11. When he therefore was come up again. Okay. We don't need that verse. His life in him. In other words, he's alive. He's been raised from the dead. There's life in him. Brethren, who knows if you're going to get a chance shortly? Who knows when you're going to get a chance? But you're already equipped. God said, occupy till I come. And one of the things that we got to do is heal the sick, raise the dead, share the gospel, freely receive, freely give. We've got to occupy because you've got to keep trading until the Lord comes. You got to keep trading because he's coming back and you're going to have to give an account. You're going to have to give an account. So I want to challenge you today to do what the Lord says. Amen? Okay, we're going to sing a song. We're going to sing a song. I don't know what song we're going to sing. If you do not have a local assembly, feel free to join us for an exhilarating time of worship. Our services are Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Sunday evening, Healing and Deliverance at 6.30 p.m. Join us in prayer on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. and for Bible study on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Bless fellowship and enjoy. The simplicity of the gospel.